Last time I went to the scrapyard, I made a huge mistake. It was July 7th, a Sunday, and I was there at my usual hour, around 8 o'clock in the morning to avoid the high temperatures around noon. But when I got there, I couldn't find any parking. Usually at that time, it is easy to find a spot somewhere to park your car. But this time, everything was blocked. So after thinking for a while, I realized... It was a public holiday, Islamic New Year, and all the places I usually go to seemed to be closed. But I was already at the scrapyard, so I didn't want to just turn around and leave. I decided to walk through the scrapyard. And while I was passing by all those places that are usually bustling with life, I heard an electric drill somewhere. Someone was working. I had to find that person, to make this trip to the scrapyard worthwhile. So I followed the noise, and after about 5 minutes, I found that person. Now usually in one trip I find one or two good items, sometimes I find even none. But as we will see today, it was a really good trip to the scrapyard, on a public holiday. I got two bags full of old retro hardware. I haven't touched them, I haven't cleaned them, I forgot what I even took. So I will try to show you every single item. It may not be all fitting into this video, so maybe there will be a follow-up. But we will go through and have a look at the items I got, one by one. And I want to show you what waited for me after I found that person with the electric drill. And after that, we have to get going on those two bags, because otherwise, they will just pile up here. So, you have seen the footage, those items are extremely dusty, that is why I'm wearing gloves, but uh, I'm really excited, I really forgot what stuff I took, I, I couldn't take everything, for instance the cases, I don't have enough space to store them, but so many nice old computers. So, let's start simple. Here is a graphics card from S3, a Trio 3D2X with a GP slot. There is nothing special about this one, I think. It's... I just have a weakness for S3 cards. It's one of my first graphic cards. I had a Trio 64V+, Plus. Um, at least the one that I remember. I, I might have had a different one, but... S3 cards are still something that always catch my my eye. And this one has 8 megabytes of video memory. And this is not uh, the one that you see often. I, I think this is maybe SG RAM or something. I'm not sure. So yeah, that's the first item. I don't want to spend much time on this one. Okay, next up is a... ISA card. It is a I.O. controller. It has all the cables still on and it's very dusty. It's from Gold Star, the chip at least. What's nice is it has some uh, configuration settings printed on the PCB and here are the jumpers. So most likely you can enable and disable some of the ports here. Uh, you have uh, uh, oh, wait a second. This has this has a parallel port. This has a serial port, another serial port, and uh, the game port on a breakout cable. 
That's interesting. Otherwise, we have a floppy cable and an IDE cable. So one IDE channel and one floppy connector. Of course, the other side is completely clean because ISA cards are stuck like this uh, face up in the computer. So all the dust collects on the component side, which is for the ISA card. Let me get the other one. Even AGP cards are different. So the component side is completely clean, but <laughs> the other side is completely dusty. So, yeah. Once I'm done with uh, showing you all these things, I will clean them one by one. It will take me probably two, three days to go through all of them and then the drying process and uh, making sure that if I find something that needs urgent attention, which I think we will have uh, today when we look at the motherboards, um, I think there is a leaking battery on one of the 386 boards or 486, I don't remember. Okay, so an I.O. controller, which is very neat for 386 systems that do not have onboard I.O. capabilities. So this is definitely nice to have. Okay, then let's move on. I got an adapter for slot 1. It's a no-name card, I guess. It has some jumpers here. For Intel, Cyrix, CPU mode, dual. Okay, so this is probably if you want to use that in a dual slot system. Uh, this is a little bit bent, but I think this can be fixed. Yeah, I will definitely not say no to a adapter card for slot one to socket 370. Okay. Next one. Another S3 card, this time a Verge DX. And it's a PCI card, so probably the other side is dusty. Yes. So it's just another S3 card. I haven't played around with any of those cards. I, I want to try the Tomb Raider patch with an S3 uh, implementation because I think you can uh, change the resolution to higher than 640 by 480 which is the one uh, Tomb Raider is limited in the 3DFX mode. Yeah, so another S3 graphics card. I would say these ones are perfect for 486 systems. Um, yeah, okay, let's move on to the next item. I'm showing you all the graphic cards right now because they're on the top, they were the lightest ones which I didn't want to uh, have on the bottom and be squished by other items. So this is a Matrox AGP card. I don't know which one this is. It says G100A, but I don't know if it has a different name. Always when I see Matrox or S3, I get weak and I just have to get them. Okay, let's move on. And uh, now we have... Uh, what do we have here? I guess we have twins. So here are two sound cards. So this is an audio drive ES1868F. And the other one is an audio drive ES1869F. So these two cards have very similar model numbers. I have no idea what the difference is between those two, but it's nice to have an ISA sound card. I think they both should support uh, sound blaster modes, so they should be sound blaster compatible. Oh. This one doesn't look that good. So this one here seems to have gotten quite hot and discolored the PCB. That's not a good sign. I didn't see that before. So it's this chip here. Um, I have to see why this happened. 
Maybe there is a short somewhere. Maybe this card is not working. Let's see the other one. Uh, this one is just a little bit dirty, but this one looks okay. So something to look out for when I'm trying to plug this into a system. Okay, ESS sound cards. So next up is a... <laughs> I didn't notice that. It's a motherboard. I thought it's a socket 3 board. But it's a socket 2. I've never seen a socket 2 board. Here it is. Socket 2. It's a socket 2 with an Intel... 46DX2, 66 megahertz. Wow. Look at that. So, what do we have here? It says V429S version 2. So this is, we'll look at the retro web in a moment. It has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ISA slots. And it doesn't have any IO controllers or IDE floppy whatsoever on the board. So that other controller card is going to uh, be handy. It also has extension uh, sockets here. Is this VLB or something proprietary? I I have no idea. I've never used VLB before, so might be interesting. Um, what else we have? We have all the cache chips populated, so it could be that this board is at its maximum configuration here. We already seen the CPU, a Intel uh, 46 DX2. We have two different types of memory here. We have the 30 pin SIM modules. This probably is maybe four megabytes. I think this is each one is a one megabyte stick. And then we have 72 pin sockets. One, two, three. Very odd number, but uh, 46 DX uh, systems were 32 bit. So you have to populate only one of those slots to make them to make them work. So otherwise uh, we have a DIN 5 keyboard connector and we have a button cell battery here i wonder if this was here from from before or if this was upgraded so i think here should have been the diodes that um, allow the rechargeable battery that is usually here to be charged and they are missing so i am assuming that this is uh, from the factory that's pretty cool so no problems on this board, which is very nice. I never had uh, a Socket 2 board. I haven't even seen one. So this is a very, very nice find. And this one I think we'll try out at some point, but not today. Let's move on with the next item. This one you have already seen before. Now we are going to have some optical drives. In this case, a HP C4495. It is a... 4 times 4 times 32 recordable rewritable drive it was made in april 2000 and it is it's a cd writer plus 8200 series it has uh, the multi read logo here which uh, means nothing but it can uh, read cd's and um, cd rewritables so it, it basically means it can read all kinds of different cds nothing uh what my i thought initially because it looks like there are multiple lasers coming in but they're just check marks so if you remember there is this one drive that has apparently 72 times the speed of regular drives and it had seven lasers in it which all worked together to read the data of the disk so it spun much lower on much lower rpms but because it had seven lasers in it and all these lasers could read data from different parts of the cd it could transfer a lot more data 
So like most of the things I get at the scrapyard, I need to make sure that I give this a good clean. Probably I have to lubricate some mechanisms and uh, yeah, hope that this item will actually work. But I'm happy to have an HP uh, CD writer. I never had one. I always looked with envy at my friends who had one of those because HP, it, it felt like a premium product at that time. But, yeah, what else can we say about this drive? So on the back, we have uh, a power connector and we have the IDE port. Then we have some configuration for selecting which drive it is on the IDE channel. And finally, you have the audio out where you can connect the CD drive to your, to your sound card. Okay. A very nice drive, and I'm happy that I could rescue this one. So this one I was really happy to to find. It is a five and a quarter floppy disk drive. So I hope that these drives still work. They are very dusty. I have no idea how to clean them yet, but Look at this, look at the motor here that probably drives some mechanism here. Teak, nice. It looks, it, it's heavy and it looks pretty sturdy. So I think this is undestroyable. Let's hope. What we have on the back. So here we have the model number. I guess it's a FD55GFR. And here's our power connector. Then you have the floppy data connector. What else do we have? Look how colorful this PCB is. Very nice. So in the front, you have the usual LED light, a very big slit for the floppy disk, and your mechanism. Unfortunately, I don't have any floppy disks at the moment, so even if I clean that drive, I wouldn't even be able to test it, but this one looks awesome. And they didn't have any covers. Like these drives were just sitting like this in the in the PC. I, I really don't know. I, I saw multiple of those drives. I may have a second one that I took. A third one was was damaged. I didn't take this one. But uh, I hope I have a I hope I have a, a second drive there. But very nice. Okay. So let's move on to another I.O. controller. And having another I.O. controller usually means that I also have another motherboard. So I'm looking forward to looking at those motherboards. Uh, again, it has jumpers to enable and disable probably some of the, of the ports, which is good because if you have a sound card that has a game port, for instance, um, this one I think should have a game port as well. Yes, it has a game port. So they may be conflicting each other if it's not um, if it's not disabled. So yeah, the problem with this one here is that it doesn't have any information printed on the PCB what those jumpers are doing. So this will be a little bit of a challenge to find out what's going on with this. So let's continue with another drive. This time a hard drive. A Seagate Medalist 6.4 gigabytes. I took these drives, I have more drives, but I took these drives because they were inside a case. They were not thrown out and just, you know, fly around on the floor and hitting each other and damaging things. So they look pretty good and they're in good condition. I hope that at least a few of them are working. And... Uh, 6.4 gigabytes usually works well with older systems because you have sometimes these thresholds where just the BIOS cannot uh, detect the drives. And 
One of these uh, thresholds, I think, is at 500 megabytes, which is for most uh, 386, uh, 386 systems. And uh, I think 8 gigabytes is a very common other barrier where you cannot go above. So 6.4 is good. This one should work in most of the, let's say, socket 7, maybe even lower uh, socket types. So it's nice to have a hard drive. Let's hope it works. Okay, let's continue with another hard drive while we are there. I found another Connor. Connor hard drives. Yeah, I tried to fix one of those and that turned out to not work out. If you want to watch the video, I link it in the top right corner. Um, so what do we have here? Do we have somewhere a size? I don't I, I can't tell right now. Okay, the back. So this drive was also in one of the cases. Um, that's why I don't think there is any mechanical issue or any physical damage. I don't know if the drive will work, but this is just a nice looking hard drive. It's just this entire enclosure. Um, yeah. Not even a date on it, is there? Maybe this one, manufactured 91, 47th week. Maybe it's a 100 megabyte disk. Maybe, I don't know. Now maybe we could Google that and figure it out, but uh, I'm too excited to look at the other stuff. So <laughs> let's move on. There is an S3 Trio 64V+. Okay, you have all seen it. Bye-bye. Let's look at a real tech device. And if you thought it's a network card, no. It's a graphics card for the ISA bus. And it has uh, some memory here, which can be upgraded to probably twice as much, which let's see, I have another ISA card and I ordered replacement chips or uh, chips to increase the Total capacity, it also had empty sockets. Maybe they are compatible here, I have to check. Uh, but I definitely didn't have any Realtek graphic cards so far. Okay, so... It was also made in 91, the chip at least. Yeah, I don't know anything about this card. But ISA graphic cards are always nice to have. You have seen that socket 2 board before. It doesn't have PCI, so you need one of those. Let's move on to something I have always had bad experience with. A Mac Store IDE drive. I don't know why. I, I feel like they're very fragile and they're dying at some point. Um, I don't know what size this is. Can I see so manufacturing date 95 in December do I see that correctly 95 December made in Singapore and yeah probably with a with a model or with a calculation of cylinders heads and sectors you will figure out how big it is and the back yeah the pretty standard looking PCB for all the drives with a lot of chips and exposed uh, the Western Digital ones, they flipped it and had the chips inside. These ones are all exposed. But I'm happy all the connectors are nice. They were all in the case and protected. So that's great. Another hard drive. So it looks like I have to make some hard drive content in the future. Okay, very briefly, a Pentium 2. 400 megahertz. 100 megahertz front side bus, two volts. You see the cache chips here on the side. There are two of them in there. A uh, Pentium 2. Always nice to have, especially if you have an older uh, slot one board. And we have another hard drive. A Seagate ST3290A. It has 250 mega. 261 megabytes. Okay. 
I have a drive like this or a similar one and they do not spin up or they make weird noises. So I hope one of these drives that I picked up this time will work. It would be really nice to have a working Seagate drive. Again, here the exposed PCB with all the chips. No damage on the connectors. Very nice. And what's this made? Drive parameters. So do you see somewhere a date here? Uh, I can't see anything. Okay, then uh, let's move on to the next one. I think I have a few more drives in there. Okay, let's just get this out of the way. So I found a few more Pentium 2s and I think they're all 400, 400, 400 megahertz, all 400. Uh, these three are in addition to the other one that I showed you already. So I have four Pentium 2s with 400 megahertz each. Okay, let's move on to the next board. This time, it's a Socket 7 board. And uh, so, what do we have here? It's revision 2.0. What is this? Here's the model number 5LTX1. Uh, what kind of chips is here? Let's have a look. So what is this? TX. It's a TX chipset. So we have an Intel Socket 7 board. I don't know which which model this is. Maybe a 200 or a 233. Uh, it's a 233. 2.8 volts. Very nice. And uh, we can see it has dual voltage regulators for the I.O. and for the core. 2.8 volts for the core and 3.3 volts for the I.O. Um, you can also see here the voltages. Uh, we have 2.8 volts, 2.9 and so on, all the way down even to 3.5 volts. Front side bus goes up to 75, 66, 75, 60, 55, and 50. Okay. And here you can see single voltage and dual voltage, so all the CPUs and the uh, MMX version of it. Um, what else? So you, here you have two IDE ports, the printer port, floppy, and two serial ports. The board has two slots for SD memory and it has an ATX power connector. That's very nice. And it came equipped with four modules of EDO memory as it looks like. I think it's EDO memory. And let's see if this is anything that... Okay, so this one has only the middle pin missing on the chip, so this could be, it could be a 16 megabyte module. Okay, so this is my socket 7 board. Let's move on to something else. Ooh, so here we have a socket 3 board, I guess, or these non sif sockets. This is, uh, what is it, LIF, a low insertion force socket. Unfortunately, I don't have a tool to remove this uh, CPU from it, and I am not sure. This one here, it looks like the CPU is a little bit toasted. It looks brown. And it says on here, fan required. I found it like this. There was no fan on this CPU, so I'm not sure. So this one looks like it ran a little bit too hot. But I don't know. It's almost not visible. 
but I think if I if I keep it away further, you can see there in the center is a brown spot. Uh, okay. Well, we'll see later, I guess, when we when we clean this board and we try to power it on. I don't know if I can remove this right now. It requires special tools, and you have to be very careful. Uh, it also supports. This supports a 386. This is not a floating point. Uh, sorry, this is not a floating point socket. This socket is a 386 socket. This is not for an FPU. So this board supports both. 386 and 486 CPUs as it looks like. So that is very nice because now I have a board that seems to support both types of CPUs. Okay, but uh, we have that friend here that I told you before. We need to we need to get this off and uh, here you can see that we already have some some damage around the battery already leaking so yeah that one should come off as soon as possible and I will do this right now so let's just get rid of this battery right away I do not want to leave it on it for any time longer any minute that the battery is on it it will continue to damage the traces around it so let's just get this thing off so let's just Do this very quickly. So. There we go. And there we go. Done. So. Let's see what the damage is. Yeah, okay. I think the keyboard connector is fine, but here definitely there are some issues. So let's do some neutralization with vinegar right away. And uh, I will just zoom in so you can see that close up. I'll just try it. Nice. Take that corrosion. Chompers are also a little bit affected, but so here I can already tell there are a few of the traces that have been eaten by the by the battery liquid. But this is nothing to worry about. I can easily fix that, hopefully. Uh, luckily, nothing went further than the battery here. So uh, I think this is the keyboard controller, this LT38C41. So nothing affected here. Everything is only in this area, so I caught it in time. I just have to check here probably a little bit. Uh, this looks fine. Just here, this tiny area is affected. So that's pretty good. Okay, uh, sorry. Always bumping the camera. Let's get this one here off. Uh, you see here it it did have a little bit of an effect on the traces here. It went under the uh, glue blob. Well, that will be a nice restoration video. Let me just rip a little bit on the jumpers here. Vinegar is still taking this stuff away. Very nice to see. Let's 
So just in case you're wondering what this is, this is just, I use white vinegar. It's nothing special. It's like $1 or something like this. But I think we are going to save this board. And here's our, our battery that caused all that damage. Rechargeable batteries. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, I'll definitely have a look at this board very, very soon. But I think... We have saved this board pretty comfortably. Okay. So what else do we have here? Um... As I already said, this board has two sockets, one for 386 and one for 486, which is pretty nice. Uh, it has some sort of, I think this is a proprietary connector for something. I, I really don't know what this is. So if you know that, let me know in the comments. Um, is there anything else that's interesting? I probably have to look up some documentation about this one do we have somewhere a model number i can't spot anything well made in taiwan probably i'm blind and i don't see it usually it's printed between the isa slots but this time i can't see anything anywhere so here in the bottom you can see some jumper settings 486 386 Cyrix, okay, some cache configuration. It's nice that some parts are printed on the board, but I cannot see any model number. Well, we will figure it out when we look on the retro web. Most likely that board has an entry there and then we will find exactly what that board is. Very nice. I can't wait to try this out because it has eight uh, memory slots and um, I wonder how much memory it supports because, well, it supports a 486. So I would expect that we can run this at 128 megabytes with the new modules that I created. By the way, I understand that some of you uh, said that you have to be careful about voltage, signal voltages. The memory modules I created are equipped with 3.3 volt chips, also uh, with a limiting voltage ceiling of 4.6 volts on the signal lines. So if the chipset sends 5 volt signals to the memory chips, it could potentially damage them. However, I heard other people say that these chips that I'm using on those modules are usually binned for 5 volts and just the data sheet says something else. I'm really not sure. I'm not an expert. I'm working on a solution for that to have modules that will work on 5 volt boards. But it's more complicated than I thought, so I'm still working on that. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the next board. Yes, I do have another board and you have seen this board uh, at the beginning when I showed you this tower of towers uh, and it had a Texas instrument CPU in it. So let's get that board out. So although it says 486 here, this is a 386 board. Um, you can see here it... Uh, accepts a 387, that's the floating point unit that can go here. But uh, this one here is actually a 386 with 486 instruction sets. This is originally designed by Cyrex and it's similar to the 5x86 that used the M1 chip from Cyrex and backported it to 486 platform. This is a 386, but it has the instruction set of a 486. 
So it should perform better than a, a pure 386 at the same clock speed, but it does not perform as well as a true 486. So I think this chip will probably perform like a 486 25 megahertz, I believe I've read, but I'm not 100% sure. This is something that we can try out later and I'm really happy to have the CPU. I hope everything works here. Um, so we have cache chips on the board. Uh, we would have a position where we could solder a 386 to this board if we don't want to use the socket. So it has so many options. That's really nice. And uh, yeah, I already see we have a battery here again and it does have some corrosion here. So I think we should get this battery off immediately. So, okay, let's do exactly the same thing what we did with the other board. So here and here, a little bit of flux. Oh, when we reach 300, we can start. Okay. So, let's get this battery off. Okay, so let's see what this little friend did to our board. Okay, not too bad, but still we do have some, some corrosion on here. But I think this is all limited to the battery connector and maybe one trace. Okay, do your magic. So this trace here seems to be affected and probably whatever is under the uh, jumper here the jumper header but everything else looks good another happy coincidence i'm really happy that these boards are not completely damaged by the corrosion So yeah, these two batteries almost killed those boards. But as you can see, all the blue stuff almost disappeared. This is just the initial treatment. I just want to try to stop it as much as possible. And very soon I will work on these boards and um, get rid of every corrosion that is left and then apply new solder mask and they will be fine. Okay, so can we get that glue blob off? There we go. Okay. Let's just clean this up. What else do we have here? Is there anything else that's interesting? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, 16 bit slots and one 8 bit ISA slot. No, nothing special here. It has an AMI BIOS. Okay. And what is this crystal here? Does this say 80? Which would make sense for this one because the crystals here. Um, on 386 boards usually are twice as fast as the bus speed. So what does it say? Come on, 
yes, 80 megahertz. So nice, I have an 80 megahertz crystal on this board, which is pretty much the fastest you could go on 386 systems. I think the AMD uh, 386 is the fastest, is faster than, I don't know if Intel made ever a 40 megahertz uh, 386 CPU, but now you have this one as well, the 486 downported 386 from Texas Instruments, originally from Cyrix. So this one will be fun. Um, this one also has one kilobyte of level one cache, if I'm not mistaken. Unfortunately, because there is also an eight kilobyte version. And uh, this was something that Texas Instruments, uh, I think, released by themselves, licensed from Cyrix, and they just increased the level one cache. So this one has one kilobytes, unfortunately only, but it should still have a significant performance improvement over regular 386. Um, what is also interesting to know is that this CPU does not have a floating point unit, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to try something that requires floating point calculations, you need to have that floating point coprocessor installed here. But... Um, yeah, I think this is a very nice board. What do you think? Uh, which of the four boards you have seen today is your favorite? I really would like to know because maybe I will just uh, prepare for a restoration video. I think nobody wants to see the Socket 7 board. I just took it because, uh, well, I thought it's nice. But um, anyway. So what? board is this actually i don't see a manufacturer but i see a part number which could mean that this is some sort of a mass-produced oem part uh, that would be a little bit unfortunate i don't know what chipset that is i may find some information and uh, maybe it is possible to get this board to 128 megabytes of system memory it has eight slots so 8 times 16 megabytes is 128. Uh, something we could try. Okay, so that was the last board, but I'm curious, which board of the ones that you've seen today do you like the most and which one do you want me to work on first? Like I have two boards that uh, require some restoration. There was the Socket 7 board, which I don't think anybody is interested in. Oh yeah, and the first board that was the uh, 486 board with the Intel DX2 in it. Um, yeah, but at the moment I'm uh, preferring actually to look at 386 boards. Very happy to have two more boards now that um, at least support 386 CPUs, like that other one that had both sockets for 486 and uh, 386. Uh, that's quite interesting. Okay, let's uh, continue. I still haven't unpacked everything. So here we have another optical drive. It is from 1997. I don't know anything else here on the front. It says CDR, 4x write. So we have a we have a CD writer, four speed. Busy writing, no manufacturer anywhere. Okay, I don't know. Uh, Matsushita Electronics, Matsushita Kotobuki. Electronics Industries. Okay. Japan. Interesting. So, what do we have here? Oh, is this a fan? It has a fan. Well, this one definitely needs to have a look. I need to have a look at this one, but Oh, this is a SCSI drive. 
Well, I remember now. Luckily, I did find also the SCSI controller card with the cable. So this drive is actually complete with the controller card. So we can try this. But let's go back to the back to the ports on the back. So we have I have no idea what this stuff is. Term term termination power? I I don't know. Terminator parity. I just know that one of my friends always told me, oh no, don't get IDE burners, you have to get a SCSI burner, it's so much better, it doesn't suffer from buffer on the run, you will not ruin CDs and all that stuff, but I always liked my Plexter burners at that time, so I can't really complain. But uh, yeah, that is interesting that this one has actually a fan. <laughs> I somehow doubt that this will work. Probably just stuck. Okay, so my first SCSI drive, just, what is that, almost 30 years late. Okay, I also got a Pentium 3 450. And I'm afraid we're not yet done with hard drives. A Quantum Pioneer. That's something I have never seen. Quantum, Quantum Pioneer SG, and it looks like this is a 2.1 gigabyte drive maximum. Nice. It was uh, 1998. So, what do we have here? Uh, okay. No longer the big uh, PCB on the bottom. Yeah, and pretty standard connectors, power, jumpers, and IDE connector. That would be a nice drive to have working. 2.1 gigabytes. That sounds like probably Pentium era, socket 7. Okay. I have another Seagate drive. Oh, wow, I think I have already two of those. I think this is 144 megabytes. I... Let me see this. ST3144. A. 131 megabytes. Oh, wow, that would be cool if this one would work. But... <laughs> We'll see. It was in a case, but still, you know, very dirty. But I hope that it survived when they threw around the cases, computer cases. Very nice. All dirty now, you know. I already messed up my gloves here and there, but better than touching that dust all the time. Okay. And this is the last drive and the last item I have. Another 260 megabytes ST. I had the same drive before already. So let's see. Maybe one of them will work. But this is the last item that was in those two bags. So I wanted to do, I wanted to make two videos, but it looks like. I will have all of this in one video. And this is just garbage falling out. There's nothing nothing to be concerned about. The drive is okay. It's just very dirty. Okay, so now I'll put this all in that corner and then I'll make a final video going over all the components while they are there. And uh, then you can let me know what was the item you enjoyed looking at the most today. What item do you want to see as early as possible on my channel? Do you have any information about the things that you have seen today? 
Um, yeah, and uh, oh, one second, I forgot something. I also got some CPUs uh, that I wanted to show you. It's just the 386 that I mentioned before. But nevertheless, it was in one of the boards that I didn't take. And the reason is it had so much battery damage that it was not worth saving. And uh, yeah, I left it in the case. I'm sorry, I didn't save that 386 board. But that board had this CPU in it. A 386 from AMD, 33 megahertz, DX. I probably can use it someday if I find either a board that has already the crystal installed, uh, 66 megahertz crystal, obviously, or I get one of these crystals and um, yeah, modify one of the boards that we have seen today to support the 33 megahertz version. Okay, then uh, I guess this is it. Thank you all for watching and I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, now let's have a final look over all the items that I showed you today. And I'm looking forward to read your comments. By the way, I read every single comment. Even if I don't reply and I don't give you the hearts, I'm still reading every comment that comes in. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for supporting me and um, yeah, I'll see you very soon. Thanks for watching and bye bye.